Hello? Are we on the air? Welcome to the Beyond the Mind podcast, where we ask not what's in your head, but what your head is in. Prepare to be inspired. Inspired to change your environment, change your mindset, and ultimately change your life. Willpower doesn't work, people. If you truly want to move away from stress and anxiety, you have to start with your environment. With your environment. So let's go. Let's apply some positive change into your world. Happiness is loading. Is loading. Welcome to the Beyond the Mind podcast. Hello, I'm Ian Highfield and I am your host. And today I'm an exceptionally proud host. And I'm super excited to be able to bring you this show with a very, very, very special guest. This is a guest that many might see as a TV celebrity as he's hosted a TV show on NBC's Golf Network for over a decade. Others might see him as a successful golf instructor, someone who helps people play better golf, someone who helps people enjoy golf. And he is, he is both of these things. But also, he is much, much more. I heard him speak in 2016 and I rapidly began to see that success is no accident. Every day, our guest strives to be better. He strives to learn and he wants to help and inspire others. After listening to his talk in 2016, I actioned much of his advice. And no doubt, his advice helped me change my environment, change my mindset, and over time, this had a positive impact on my life. His presentation and now his support, guidance and mentorship have inspired me and I'm excited to be able to provide you, the listeners, the same chance to get the same information that I did in 2016 and use it to take strides towards your goals and dreams. Let's go, let's check out the conversation that I had with NBC TV's Mr. Martin Hall. Mr. Martin Hall, how are you? Hey, and I'm, I'm doing as well as we can all be doing in this uh, most difficult time we find ourselves in with this wretched coronavirus thing, but uh, I'm doing okay. Yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a weird time. It's a strange time. Um, what, what are you doing um, to, to try... Uh, and, and stay more positive at this, uh, in this position that, that we find ourselves in? Well, I think we have to be careful about the definition of positive at a time like this. There's been a lot of casualties, a lot of businesses have been affected. So to just look at the world through rose-colored glasses and think, everything's fine, everything's going to be wonderful, everything's going to be rosy. When we come out the other side, we're all going to be stronger. I actually think that's a load of crap. I do think there are better ways to look at it than there's some ways are better to look at than others. And I'll, I'll, I'll just start our conversation off with a, a quote that has helped me keep the right frame of mind. For me, positive thinking is a, a, a good frame of mind, irrespective of the condition you find yourself in the circumstances. So, and I don't remember where I got this from Ian, but, when you're in a situation such as we are in now, or, or, or going forward, situations that are difficult, instead of thinking, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine, like it was a Disney movie nursery rhyme, <laughs> I think the definition of positive thinking is to ask yourself, what is the most constructive response for me and those around me at this time? Now, a constructive response to me is completely different than pretending that someone, the fairy godmother is going to come down and touch the globe with a, with a wand and everything's going to be fine. There are constructive things we can be doing. While we have this time on our hands, social distancing, a lot of us at home, you can try and upgrade your skills in whatever endeavor you are in so that when the dust does begin to clear and it does begin to settle, you perhaps have some skills come coming out of this that you didn't have coming into it. So, so what am I doing? I'm trying to develop some skills that I didn't have two months ago 
and that in two months' time, hopefully I'll be a lot better at than I am now. I'm, I'm trying to educate myself in all sorts of areas. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's my definition of positive thinking, that I think, you know, when, when people have lost family members, for, to, to hear the message, now you've just got to be positive. Like, there's nothing positive about the fact you just lost my grandfather. What's positive about that? What you can do, though, is know that this will pass. This too will pass for most of us, for many of us. And I think when it does, if you can be a better version of you than you were in January when this darn thing started, then, you know, we, we're contributing in the best way we can. That's, that's amazing. I feel like we could clip the podcast there and that holds enough no, value I, I, in, its, no, in itself. No, I, have, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> I'm on your podcast, you've got to listen to me. <laughs> I haven't finished yet. So, Martin, the, the, the reason that I asked you on the show um, is many people know you as um, the professor from the School of Golf. Um, a very um, well-established golf coach in, in Florida uh, and really at, at, at the peak of, of your career for, for, for almost a decade now, appearing on television and giving golfing advice. Um, and it was because of this that I actually came to listen to you speak. Uh, I think it was around 2016 um, in Florida at the, at the PGA show. Um, that and of course you being from the Midlands where I'm from in England as well was the other the other big draw um, but on hearing you speak this presentation you very rarely mentioned golf and you mentioned more things that you'd done in your life that helped you master your craft and I didn't know you at this time it was very inspirational for me I left that talk um, really motivated, really pumped up, and I took action. Your talk made me make environmental changes. It made me think a little differently. It made me try and hone my skills. So linking that back to what you've just said, um, if you think about how your talk had an impact on me, and if you think about what you've just given, the advice you've just given on the coronavirus, what specifically do you recommend that people could be doing at home right now? Or what do you recommend that people could be doing to, in their journey of life to come out of this uh, stronger and a, and a better version of themselves, as you put it? Well, I think there's, look, there's so much information on the internet um, available to us. Our field happens to be golf. It's where we make our living. But... I think the skills that make people stand out above others for the most part are the same no matter what industry you're in. And, and people who sort of get to the, to the higher echelons of their industry, if you study successful people, they, success leaves clues, as Tony Robbins famously said. I've always been interested in success, even before I started playing golf. I, why, why some people are more successful than others has always fascinated me. And I've made my living out of it being golf, but, but I've studied my hobby. My hobby has really been looking at what makes somebody a successful uh, banker, what makes someone a successful doctor, what makes someone a successful engineer. Uh, why are some of the people I work with, with Club at Ibis, like Stephen Logadice, why is he such a fantastic general manager at the golf club why is Ben Bauer my golf director such a great golf director and it, it's it's the habits they have developed it's the books they read it's it's how they challenge themselves so we all have to be doing that all the time and, and I think there's a few things I'd like the opportunity to put out here that have been very helpful to me and so I hope they'll be helpful to you know those that listen to the to, to the podcast so I think one of the things you have to understand is Getting better is a struggle. Getting better is uphill. Getting better needs grit, but getting better is worth it. So I think it's a struggle, it's uphill. Uh, there's, no, there's no coasting, there's no coasting downstream if you want to improve your situation, no matter what business. And you've got to be prepared to do what most people won't do. If, if people just did that, it doesn't matter what industry they're in, Ian, if people would sort of look at what most people do and not do that, do something different, do something more, do something better, 
then you'll, you'll find your way towards the high end of whatever field you are in. I, I think people who are highly successful, they, they are a bit neurotic. I mean, I certainly know I'm a bit neurotic. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm painted with the brush that I, I read this from a, a Malaysian proverb, one of my very favorites. I, I tell my young junior golfers this when they're getting a little bit too, uh, a bit too pleased with themselves, a bit too smug, a bit too cocky, as you and I might say. <laughs> so a little quote for all of us to remember when things seem to be going well, you know, perhaps last December when everything was so good. Here's the quote, and it's, it's, it's a lifetime quote, really. Just because the river is quiet, it doesn't mean the crocodiles have left. That's, that's a Malaysian proverb. Just because the river is quiet, it doesn't mean the crocodiles have left. Translation to the world at large. No matter what business you're in, if everything seems to be going fine, don't relax. Don't take your eye off the ball. Don't stop doing what got you where you are. Redouble your efforts. Try harder because just below the surface, there are crocodiles. Just because you can't see them. Every business is threatened by crocodiles all the time. So just because the river is quiet, it doesn't mean the crocodiles have left. So I'm always thinking, and I always have, what if this happened? What if that, that happened? Um, try, trying to look a little bit ahead, trying to have a, a game plan if things went a bit wrong, whether it's financially or physically or whatever it might be. So I think that's important to know. I think that on, 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 on a journey to try and be the best you can be, which is what I've tried to, I'm not a big goal setter, Ian. Um, yeah. I've, just, my whole life, I've just tried to be a better version of Martin Hall tomorrow than I am today. So I'm trying to find something, um, a slight edge on me, a slight improvement on me, so I'm a better version tomorrow and th than I am today. And one of the things you have to do to do that is be prepared to do uncomfortable things, do things you don't want to do, do things that make you nervous, do things that are a bit scary for you. I'll give you an example of one of those. So last summer, just before the Open Championship, I was on the practice ground at the medalist hitting some golf balls. And the only other player on the practice ground at the medalist was Tiger Woods. Martin Hall and Tiger Woods on the practice ground. I was watching Tiger hitting golf balls. He wasn't watching me hitting golf balls. I was watching <laughs> Tiger. And, and I thought, you know what? I was just about to do a show on the Golf Channel about putting, and I thought, I know, I know Tiger likes to putt just with his right hand only. I thought, deep breath, storm across the range, I'm going to ask him. I'm going to ask him about this right hand thing. And I was, I mean, I've met Tiger a few times, but he's on the range, he's on his own, he's just before the Open Championship. But I made myself do something that I was incredibly uncomfortable doing. So I walked over to the range, I chatted to him. He said hello. And I said, look, I've got some questions for you. And I didn't know if he was going to tell me to take a, a long walk off a short pier or growl at me or have me removed from the property or be gracious with his answer. And it was the latter. And so because I made myself do something that I was very uncomfortable doing, I ended up with a good 15 minute talk with Tiger Woods one on one about how he moves his putter back and forth and why he does that. Now, it would have been the easiest thing in the world to not do that. Absolutely. But I made myself do it. So I, th I think you have to do things that scare you a bit. I think you have to be okay being uncomfortable. You have to be one of the things in life, I think, is if you're going to continue to go forwards in your field of endeavor, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, we, we did some TV work for those that haven't seen the Golf Channel. Ian and I did a TV show just a little bit before all this uh, wretched con coronavirus stuff happened. And it's, you know, when you're in there in a studio and there's five cameramen and a director and a producer in your ear and lights, and there's a lot going on, isn't there, Ian? A lot I, going on. I can vouch for that. And I definitely felt uncomfortable. I think it shone through at points, but, you know. No, uh, I think you did well. But, but look. The other thing I would say to that is everybody is uncomfortable before they get comfortable. If, if, you're, if you're on the ladder of life improvement, which doesn't have a ceiling on it, uh, 
and you know, for ne you know, the next rung up on that ladder, so you're going to be uncomfortable. Now, when you get there, you'll get comfortable. Don't stay there very long. Find something else uncomfortable to do. If you're comfortable, you're not growing. If you're comfortable, you're not getting better. If you're comfortable, you're not stretching. And if there'll be anything they put on my tombstone is, it will be the bugger wouldn't stop trying. He just kept trying. And that's, that's what I like to do. That's what I enjoy doing. That's what I try and influence people to do, whether it's an Ian Highfield or people who watch me on Sky TV or around the world, wherever it is, or golfers I meet or, or you know, family members. It's like, come on, let's try. Oh, we can't do that. Well, we won't know if we don't try, will we? And if you try something and it doesn't work, you adjust your process a little bit. Every... Ian, you, you kindly said that that speech I gave at the Cronin Group was, was very instrumental to you and, you know, very informative, ins inspirational to you. And ev every major step that I have taken in my life has been by taking action and doing something very uncomfortable. Every, everyone, from, from when I first, uh, I don't know that I told this story, but I, I, I was a not a bad golfer, played for Staffordshire, was one handicap when I was about 16. So I wasn't bad. I wasn't great, but I wasn't bad. Played for the county, turned pro, played on the European tour a little bit, lost my European tour card by missing a four foot putt on the last hole. Wow. Did not, did not know what I was going to do and got wow. a job, got a job teaching at Trenton golf club as an assistant pro, but didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. So I got some magazines. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> in the back of one of these magazines, and I never look at classified ads, I don't think I do, but there was a small classified ad that said, coming to Turnbury, Scotland soon, Golf Digest schools, famous teachers, Bob Tosky, Jim Flick, Peter Costas, and if you don't know who they are, it doesn't matter, because this was a long time ago. And I thought, this was, this was the take in action, but I thought, wow, that's amazing. I'm going to write a letter. So I'm sitting in Stoke-on-Trent, and I write a letter to Norwalk, Connecticut, which I had no idea where it was. I never expected to get a response. The letter being, could I come and watch? That's all I asked, could I come and watch? And I got a letter back 10 days later from Norwalk, Connecticut, and they said, yes, you could come and watch. So I drove up to Turnbury, Scotland, and I, I mean, I can't tell you how nervous I was going into Turnbury. And they were great with me. So that started my career in America because then from that I made a relationship that took me to America. When I went to work for Jack Nicholas, I saw that Jack was opening a golf school with Jim Flick. I wrote them a letter. That's what we used to do back then. We didn't have <laughs> you know, they come, they come in the mail. They come in the post, these things with stamps on. Yes. <laughs> um, but I wrote a letter. And, and everything that's happened to me that's given me a, a leap in my career, everything has been where I took, put my, you know, put my heart in my mouth, took a leap and, and saw what happened. Um, and I don't think you get anywhere without asking, as, as Jack Canfield says, and if you don't know who Jack Canfield is, if you listen, you want to study some of his stuff, because he's a wonderful man on success and the journey and, you know, balancing your life as much as you can. He says, look, you have to become an absolute asshole. And I think it's great. <laughs> you do have to become an asshole. You have to ask, 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 ask. And he goes, SW, 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 SW. Some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. I think it's fantastic. So, so you know, when you're asking somebody something, some will say yes, some won't. Some will, some won't. Um, you know, so what? Someone's waiting. Just keep going, keep asking, because you will get answers eventually. And it's just feed. It's just feedback. It's just feedback. And if you listen to the feedback and correct course on a frequent basis, you will you will get better. But without feedback, you just keep doing the same stuff. You're just in that comfortable zone, which is is no good. I don't like being comfortable. Comfortable is not good for anybody. It's Martin. That I, I just want you to keep going. It's on it, it, the the. How I feel right now, like I just want to go and those emails that I wanted to write people about my next book or my podcast or doing corporate talks, I just want to go and write them. I'm almost ashamed that I haven't written them. You know, it, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't say that. Don't be, I don't, 
you'd ever be ashamed of anything you haven't written them. I mean, we're all, we're all learning and, and um, I'll come a little bit to TV in a minute about what I've learned about doing TV, but we've, we've all had someone who's been a mentor to us. We've all had someone who kicked us up the, the derriere when we needed it. Um, and I think having someone to push you is, is a good thing. And, and, you know, perhaps it's a father, perhaps it's a mother, perhaps it's a sister. And sometimes you think, are they never satisfied? Well, actually, it's a really good thing. If you've got someone behind you who's never satisfied, I, I, I say to the people I teach golf, you can be pleased, but don't be satisfied. Yeah, Wherever you're right. at, ple pleased is okay. Enjoy it. Stay there for a while, but not too long. But don't be satisfied. And so how, how do you do that when things aren't going that well? Well, like the people searching for the vaccine right now, and we, you know, we desperately need this vaccine so, as soon as we can possibly get it. And I, I, I learned this story, I actually learned it at Epcot. I went to Epcot years ago. And if you go to Epcot, you'll see there's a, a sort of a, a, a piece, a museum-like piece for a man called Mel Fisher, or there used to be anyway. And most people won't know who Mel Fisher is. But I don't know that I talked about him at the pro proponent group. Mel Fisher was a treasure hunter archaeologist type treasure hunter not indiana jones type he was uh, out on the open seas looking for gold on the water and he had this belief that there was a galleon that had been sank just off the coast of florida this was in 19 the early 1980s and so he got some money together and he got a crew together and and for i think it was six or seven years he searched for this galleon that no one believed existed and they couldn't find it. And how did, he, how did he keep the crew going every day? Finding funding from goodness knows where, I don't know. But how did he keep the crew going every day? Every day when he got up, and this, you'll like this one, I love this one. Today is the day, today's the day yeah. we find treasure. And so I think in life, you have to believe that every day you get up, Today is the day. Maybe today is the day someone makes a breakthrough with a vaccine. Today is the day I can get better. Today is the day. Now, Mel Fisher, to his credit, he kept his crew going all that time. Today is the day. Today is the day I can do this. Today is the day I can make a breakthrough with my God. Today is the day I can make a breakthrough with my career. Because it could be. Mel Fisher, in 1985, found the boat and with it, $450 million worth of gold. Because wow. he, gets, yeah, it's a great story, isn't it? True story. You, you, you look him up and Google him. Oh, okay. Today's the day. And I think that's, that's my message really as, as, as a teacher. I, I think I teach golf, but I'd like to think I'm just, I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, your, your certainty has to be greater than the student's uncertainty. You can do this. Of course you can do this. Come on, get on with it. You can do this. Your certainty has to be greater than the student's uncertainty. And you have to have a, today is the day. Today's the day I'm going to do it. You have to have a lot of that in you. You have to have a lot of Mel Fisher in you to deal with what we have to deal with in life, especially today, and especially what we're going to have to deal with going forwards. We've got the health thing to get through. We've got the health system thing and hopefully that holds up and then we're going to have the economy to deal with after that but every day we need to get up and say today is the day today is the day i'm going to do something that scares me but something good may come out of that and if it doesn't just adjust course keep trying stuff keep trying stuff i actually heard tony robbins say something one time that really really struck with me someone said to him tony i can't, I can't do i've tried everything and Tony said, you haven't tried everything because if you tried everything, you would have found an answer. I thought that was unbelievable. That still touches me to this day because if you tried everything, you would have found an answer. So just keep trying stuff. Keep trying stuff. Don't keep doing the same stuff because we know what happens. If you, I, mean, I finish every television show I do by saying that. If you keep on doing what you've been doing, you'll keep on getting what you've been getting. Finish every TV show with that. So I think you have to keep trying to do stuff. You have to keep doing scary stuff. 
you have to realize that you know some some days are harder than others but that that's what makes me tick that's what makes me get up in the morning that's 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 my message that's what i want to leave behind i know i did say this at the uh, that speech i gave because i think this is this is so far powerful Th those of you that are in a role of leadership if you're a mentor to someone your job as a mentor is to number one teach people how to think don't necessarily give it to them but teach people how to think if you teach people how to think about situations you're doing a you're doing them a service and once you've taught them how to think then you challenge them you don't give them the answers you don't make it easy for them we don't we don't get our stripes we don't get our spurs if everything's served to us on a silver platter difficult difficulty is good difficulty makes you better so one is you teach people how to think if you're a good mentor two is you challenge people and three is you be the best role model you can possibly be and the role model would be someone who I think is genuine, sincere, transparent. You do what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. And that's, that's I'd, I'd like to think that's who Martin Hall is, Ian. Well, I, I would agree that that is who Martin Hall is. And, and you know, you've been, we've only really known each other personally. Um, really, we met in, in January and got to know each other personally. Obviously, I knew you before that, being on television, on a show that I watch, and um, watching you speak. Um, but I, I'll remember when you phoned me up, and I saw your name on my phone, and I'd just come out of the shower. <laughs> I, I was, I was knick-knack naked, and I was like, i got to take this. It's Martin Hall. So I answered... I I actually didn't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm dripping wet from the shower. It was at Champions Gate. I'd just been for a run at Champions Gate. And I, and, and I answer it. And I'm like, uh, hello. And I don't even, I'm, I'm, I'm probably overthinking what voice I'm using. And then you say, yes, you're on the Golf Channel. I'll take care of it. I'll look after you. This is going to be fun. This is the date. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is unbelievable. And then I look and it clashes with something else. And I said to myself, there is no way that I am gonna say no to you. I am going to make this happen. And I couldn't get out of my other commitment that was on the other side of the USA. Now, it was so, as you would say, uncomfortable trying to marry all this up and get it to work, but I had to. And it actually resulted in me finishing my talk in Arizona having one hour and 15 minutes to get to a flight, getting on that flight, making, I think, three flights into Orlando, checking into a hotel, getting lifts, and then coming to see you the next day. It, it was an uncomfortable situation, but not for one second did I ever think that I wasn't going to make it work. Um, and I think that was partly you, your energy, and, and you were willing to be flexible. But then the second thing, Martin, was your, you gave me some constructive criticism before I went on the Golf Channel. And I'm so grateful for that because I feel like the episode came out well. And if you hadn't given me that constructive criticism, it might not have come out as it did. So, you know, when, sometimes when people say things to you that can potentially make you uncomfortable, they shy away from them. But you gave me some constructive criticism about how to come across on camera and what you'd seen before. And, and I really took it to heart. Um, and honestly, it's probably ingrained in this podcast now. And then it's probably ingrained in everything I do um, from beyond there. So, you know, to, to me, you're way more than a, than a golf coach. You're, you are, you're a mentor, you're, you're a leader, you're an inspiration. And, and anyone who's listened to the first 25 minutes of this podcast can hear that. So it, that was why I was so desperate to, to get you on because your message transcends golf. It, it goes into life and it can fuel anyone um, to make positive change. But I do want to, I do want to home in on, on one bit on your journey that I really can don't. I just, I, can I just say one thing to that last yeah. comment? That you had there, and so one thing that I believe, and I, I read this again years ago. So obviously I like to read. I think, I think all, 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 all leaders are readers. I've heard that, but most people, if, if the people listening to this can dig into what I'm about to say, 
most people would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. And criticism is, feedback is criticism. So I gave you some feedback. It wasn't criticism. It's just, look, you'll be better if you do this. And you, and you have done better. So that's great. And I, you know, I asked for feedback. But most people would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. This world we live in, I think some people say, well, we're just going to see positive things. You're like, no, no. Sometimes a kid, good <laughs> kick up the bum is a good thing. <laughs> if it makes you better because of it. So... You know, for those that are listening, please buy into that. Most people are ruined by praise and rather than be saved by criticism. Fe feedback. Feedback isn't negative. It's just information. And it's, well, you choose what you do with it. But if you want to get better at anything, you've got to change what you're doing. You've got to upgrade it. So anyway, well, so what was the other thing we wanted to talk well, about here? I, I wanted to just ask you, you you did an amazing job articulating your journey from um professional golfer european tour and I, I didn't actually know that to then um writing these letters taking action going to this golf school and then ending up in the usa but the journey didn't stop there so i'm personally interested in television and presenting and obviously i'm doing a podcast and youtube etc I'm personally interested in how you went about being on one of the biggest networks in the USA for 10 seasons. I want to know how you made that happen and then how you managed to maintain that for so long because everything on television has a lifespan and, or an expiry date. Or, and for, to do it for 10 seasons is just phenomenal. So how did you get there? And then how um, did you maintain it um, regarding your journey and breaking into television? And then, of course, like you've said, if you want to be an attorney, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a CrossFit athlete, you could take some of these qualities and apply them into your own environment. Yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about that. Well, uh, I... I I, I had always wanted, I mean, I'd done some television when I was working for Jack Nicholas. I'd done some TV working for Jack, and I'd done some stuff on the Golf Channel. But I, I had always believed that I could do it, but I hadn't had the opportunity to do it. Uh, but I'd always believed, like Abraham Lincoln said, I will prepare and my time will come. And I've done that with everything I've done. I'll prepare and my time will come. Abraham Lincoln said, I think he said, if I had seven hours to chop a tree down, I would spend six hours sharpening the axe. That spoke to me a lot. Mm. That you, you, get, you get ready for the event before the event reveals itself to you. Keep your skill, sharp, skill set really sharp. So I'd, I'd done a little bit on the Golf Channel, but back in 2010 the Golf Channel decided they were going to have a talent search for the next teacher to have a, have a chance of a show on the network. And, and I said to my wife, actually, at that time, I said, do you think I should put something in? She said, no, you're too old. You're too fat. <laughs> you did. You did. You're too old. You're too fat. Anyway, you don't want to do that. That's just big break for golf instructors. You don't want to do that. And fortunately, fortunately, Someone from the Golf Channel called me and said, look, you need to send in a demo tape because you were already shortlisted. You're already on our radar, but this is a real talent search. We're doing it properly, and you would have to earn your position there. So I did have a, I did a demo tape, sent it in, and then they came down to – then they had a vote on it, a public vote on it. Um, and – there were three of us. It was Wayne Player, Karen Palacios, Jansen, and me. And we all did a show. And then there was another vote on it, and I got the show. Well, when I got the show, that was 2011. When I got the show, I thought, well, I might have, I don't know, eight shows, nine shows. Mm -hmm. So I go up there, and Kevin Schultz, who's my boss, gave me a list. I said, what's this? He said, well, this is your schedule for this year. 38 shows. I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> and I was... I was terrified. But what am I going to say for 38 shows? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I started to listen to, to, to get my, I knew I could teach golf. I just didn't know if I could teach golf on television with the difficulties of five cameras and time codes and all the difficulties that go with it. 
and there's always something going wrong on television, whatever you think you see with, if you're watching Lester Holt on NBC or something, I promise you, there's always something going wrong. There always is in all television. You just don't see it. But I thought, well, how can I upgrade my, my skill level? So I started looking at how people present. And I, 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 I kept getting this, this feedback from my producer. You need more energy. And I said, well, what's more energy? Well, you need more energy. And so I didn't know what more energy was. And then, by, I don't know by chance, I kept thinking about that. But then I, I started watching adverts on TV, not so much live speakers, but adverts on TV. And I suddenly had this idea. I thought, well, to understand how someone does presenting, I'm going to go a little bit over the top. I'm going to watch this ad on TV. And I recorded it. I recorded it on the video. And then I thought, I'm going to watch it back and see it without any sound. So turn the volume down. And then I just saw how when they're doing ads, particularly when they're doing ads, how do the people move? Do they move the hands? Do they move the head? How does the body move? What's the body language? And I found that although they move the feet, although they move the hands, they rarely move the head from side to side. And I looked at my version of TV and I was weaving from side to side as if I was trying to, uh, you know, as if I was playing football at, uh, mm. at Old Trafford, trying to weave round somebody <laughs> there. So I stopped doing that. So I actually started watching people without volume. And then I turned the volume up and turned my back on the TV. And I listened to how they said it. And I found that there is a, with good presenters, there is a melody. There is a change in the tone. It isn't just some maniac rant at high volume. I mean, typically it would be, they will start loud, but then they will get quieter and slower and make that point. So to me, it was like, I, I saw music in front of me where notes change and tempo changes. And, wow. And that, that certainly helped me with presenting to watch with no volume how people move and then listen with no picture how people change tone and pace. And then I started listening to the best newsreaders like Lester Holt. And you'll find they don't go on a rant. They're not, they're not monotone. They're not loud and monotone. And I, I tend to see my, my feedback to a lot of people on YouTube would be, look, you're in one of two camps, son. You're either standing on top of a milk crate going monotone and going ballistic, and you sound, you sound and look like a madman, <laughs> or on the other end of the scale, you stand, you're cowering like a timid little mouse. You're not, you haven't got good posture. It, it's amazing how important posture is on television to pull your, pinch your shoulder blades together, to stand up. What they, what they actually call in the TV, isn't it, TV business, pull your string up. So when you're presenting, if you imagine you had a piece of string out of the top of your head, imagine someone pulled it up out of the ground like you're a puppet. And you might only grow half an inch taller than poor posture, but it looks a lot better. So you, you become aware of posture, you become aware of pace, you become aware of volume, you come, become aware of, of actually emphasizing certain words, certain times, you become, of end, you become aware of ending a a conversation with an exclamation mark and I, I would say I'm sure a trial lawyer is exactly the same I think a great presenter at university would be the same there's there's a little bit of showmanship in it and and you have to have that <clears throat> if you're going to be in front of camera you have to have a bit of showmanship for sure that's amazing so ultimately <clears throat> once you got there you just worked on mastering your craft. And, and I, I knew that story from the proponent group. And that was when I started thinking, you know what, I'm gonna do more YouTube stuff. You know what, I'm gonna do um, a podcast. I'm gonna put information out there. I'm gonna practice um, talking on stage. So what I actually did was I started recording my talks. When I get invited to talk on stage, I record them and I listen to them and I walk around and I don't say the words, I'm, I like mime the speech. So I started to take what you were doing for TV and do it in my own way for when I get asked to, to speak on stage. And people would come to me and say, oh, you're a natural. 
And I'm <laughs> like, you have no idea, no idea what I did to get to that point. Yeah, well, that's, that, that's for sure. But um, I think when you say, you know, I mastered my craft, I actually don't see it that way at all. I, as, as I said earlier, I, I'm just trying to be a slightly better version tomorrow than I am today in whatever it is I do. I'm still working at the golf game trying to, you know, be a better player tomorrow than I am today. And so I don't think, I don't think you ever master it. I think you, you, you get better at it. I only ever listen to my, I only ever watch my shows once. I film them up there. I watch them once. I look at what I could do better than I move on because I think if you watched it too much, if you took it apart too much, you would paralyze yourself. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing I do when I'm, when I'm filming, I actually look what I call, I look right through the camera, whichever of the five cameras I'm looking at. I, 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 I know the cameraman's there, but, but you know what? I don't see him. I'm looking right through the camera and I am talking to somebody. I don't have a person in particular I'm talking to, but I am talking to somebody and I am caring about the fact that I, I mean to help them. And I think it has to be, it has to be about, it has to be about the person on the other side of the camera. It's not, it's not about me. And people say things to me now that have had a lot of worldwide success and a lot of recognition. People say, oh, you know, they say to me, oh, you're such a natural. And, and Martin, when I meet you in person, you're exactly the same in person as you're on television. It's like, well, why wouldn't I be? This is <laughs> I don't, there's nothing. There's nothing fake about it, and that's. I listen to Oprah Winfrey a lot, actually, because of course she was, still is, has been so successful. But she says the camera will know if you're authentic or not. The camera will know if you care. And people say, well, it's just about you know being enthusiastic. It's more than that. It's more than being enthusiastic. It's about truly and utterly caring and being quite transparent and not pretending to be what you're not. Be who you are. Yeah. Warts and all. Cromwell said, "Be who you are." That's what I would say, and care about the person on the other side of the camera. So I think those are the things that, those are the things that have helped me be on TV for ten years. And I, I would tell you this: in I treat every show as if it was my first show. I wow. never take everything, never take anything for granted because, as I started this little rant, I, I, I live with this sort of just because the river is quiet, it doesn't mean the crocodiles have left. Um, feeling in my body and that's why although I think this te we're in a terrible situation in many ways with this coronavirus I'm not utterly shocked about it because I felt that something would come along because things do come along in your life whatever they may be family problems health problems business problems they don't they, 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 they're coming you know if a wave isn't hitting you don't worry there's one on the way that's for sure and yeah. it's just how you it's how you deal with it and things things are never that easy when you see someone who's highly successful it's easy to think oh their life must be really easy they've got the big car they've got this they've got that nobody's life is easy you mm -hmm. don't know what anybody else's life is like unless you walk in their shoes. Everybody has problems and everybody has to brush the teeth in the morning, otherwise their breath smells. That's, <laughs> the, that's how it works. Martin, there are so many gems in this that, that people can extract and um, apply into, <clears throat> excuse me, into their environment to help them uh, become better. Um, I'm very grateful that you came on. Before we wrap it up, yep. um, I would like you, the quick fire round, to give us three people that you would recommend the viewers watch on like YouTube or motivational talks or videos, and then maybe three books that would be in Martin's library that they, they have to read. Yeah, no, I, well, I, no I, I, I can do that for sure. I mean, I don't know if this is because I didn't know this was coming, but three people you should watch on YouTube. I would say Brendan Bouchard. I think he's great. Yep. Very applicable, um, actionable wisdom. Uh, I think Jim Rohn, the timeless wisdom of Jim Rohn, absolutely amazing. Um, there's, there's a lot of newer people, obviously, on the podcast like yourself. Um, who do I like there? Who else would I watch on YouTube? 
Um, Darren Hardy, I think, is really good. Darren Hardy is good. So those would be my three sort of YouTubers or podcasts. Uh, books, I would say. The Slide Edge by Jeff Olson, I think, is an amazing book. Absolutely amazing book. Um, what other books would I have without going into my library? I don't. I actually don't want to pick up the iPad here and actually lose the connection to go to my library. I think some of Earl Nightingale's stuff is still timeless. Yeah. Um, what else have I got there that I think would be good? I think one one of my favorite books that I go back to again and again and again is Jack Canfield, The Success yep. Principles. I think it's a fantastic book, and there's so much you'll. You know, if, if you do dig into the success principles by Jack Canfield, you, you'll hear a lot of it in whatever it is I've said today. Mm. But I think it's just great. He's, he's a great influencer. You know, people talk about the social influencers and, 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 and all the, the new stuff on social media. I would say Jack Canfield is a real influencer, not, yeah. not just a social influencer because he's got, you know, a dog that can jump through a hula hoop while it's on fire. <laughs> well... Um, <clears throat> I think it's I think it's obvious, Martin, that you have watched these great influencers, read these great influencers, and then actioned it into um, your own life. Um, since I watched you speak at the proponent group, your words have always stuck with me. And then since we did a little bit of work together starting at the start of this year, um, you know, the influence you've had on me. Um, is amazing. I cannot wait to finish this podcast, re-listen to it, take notes and get some of those books. And again, action, um, the, the, the nuggets of knowledge that are in here and also the, the, the reading that, that you've just recommended. Um, I can't thank you enough for, for what you've done for me. I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast and sharing your knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. Is there anything that you want to sign off with? I just think that I would say to all of us in this difficult time, just keep going, keep putting one step in front of the other. I had a great, a great friend of mine uh, lost his son in, in, um, in an airplane crash, a terrorist airplane crash um, years ago, Lockerbie, Scotland, you might remember it. Yes, wonderful, I do, yes. Wonderful mentor of mine. And he said it was so hard to get over it. He said, but he would go to Scotland every year. And the Scottish have a phrase that says, I can't go on. I must go on. And so I think for all of us, we have to go on. We just have to go on. It's what we have to do. I'd, I'd agree with that. Martin, I, I can't thank you enough. I can't wait to um, get this out there. Your words uh, will, will ring with me. Uh, and uh, I, as you've just said, I'll, uh, I'll keep going on. Uh, thanks very much for your time and uh, you and your wife stay stay safe uh, during this uh, strange period. All right, Ian. Thanks, thanks man. Brian. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay Bye. safe. Bye-bye. Bye. You've just taken a step forward to making a positive change in your life. That's right. You're one step closer to leaving frustration, stress, and anxiety behind. This was the Beyond the Mind podcast. Let's apply some positive change into your world. Into your world.